Hello and welcome everyone. My name is uh, Rick Frage. I'm the sales manager of uh, SF Tech. Um, <clears throat> today we are uh, going to have a webinar titled Design of GFRP RC Bridge Tech Slab Slabs according to Ashto LR FD Bridge Design Guide specifications for GFRP reinforced concrete. This webinar is prepared and presented by Dr. Ahmed Salama. Uh, it's a pretty uh, technical webinar uh, full of equations. So if you want to keep a pen and paper, we recommend that so you can follow up with, uh, follow with Dr. Ahmed. Um, and certainly if you have any questions, you can feel free to use um, the icons at the bottom of the screen. Uh, in the meantime, um, we will be, uh, towards the end of the webinar, we will be sending you a poll or survey. We'd like to, we, we'd like to hear from you, uh, your feedback about the webinar. Uh, so let me introduce Dr. Ahmed. So Dr. Ahmed is a structural expert, uh, design expert at SF Tech, Montreal, Canada. He received his PhD from the University of Sherbrooke uh, in Canada. Uh, before joining the University of Sherbrooke as a PhD student, he served as a, a bridge engineer at the Egyptian Ministry of Water Resources and Irrigation, where he started to supervise the different construction phases of bridges. And then he worked as bridge design engineer for short span bridges that were constructed over the, uh, the, the Nile River. During his PhD studies, um, uh, uh, Dr. Salama tested full-scale edge slab uh, column connections, which extracted from a prototype of GFRPRC flat plate uh, parking structures. These tests aimed at, stimul at simulating uh, the real case of such connections, quantifying the behavior and, str uh, and strength of such connections, and finally introducing new design formula for the FRP design standards in Canada and the US, which are CSA S806-12 and ACI 1440, uh, uh, sorry, um, ACI 440.1 R15. Uh, so Dr. Salama also contributed um, in the CSA certification test of different FRP material for FRP manufacturers in Canada, US, and Germany, and China under the supervision of Professor Ibrahim Venmokran. While he's working uh, with SF Tech, uh, which he joined about a year and a half ago, um, he worked on different structures, including um, uh, water purification stations, parking garage, uh, uh, slabs, uh, what, uh, retaining uh, walls, and uh, um, basis for communication towers and many other types of structures. So <clears throat> I'll be introducing a little bit uh, SF Tech, and then I'll hand the mic to Dr. Ahmed. So about SF Tech, uh, we are qualified entrepreneur in the industry of fiber reinforced polymer bars. So we're associated with Shandong Safety Industries, which are based in Shandong, China which are specialized in FRP, in the manufacturing of fiber reinforced <clears throat> polymer bars. We are the exclusive um, sales associates uh, uh, for Shandong Industries uh, in, in globally uh, with the exclusion of Asia. So we target national and international engineering firms and we try to target um, different structures including a parking facilities, water treatment plants, and retaining walls. Our focus is to educate and expand uh, the FRP market applications, uh, mainly in North America, Europe, and Latin America, and Australia. So what is FRP? Uh, basically, FRP, as you can see from these drawings, if you put um, uh, FRP under the microscope, you will see that it's mainly fiber. It could be glass or anything else. That is uh, uh, reinforcing a polymer. So you'll see here the resin, and that's the interface between the fiber and the resin. So fiber, FRP stands for fiber reinforced polymer, and uh, it comes as an alternative to, an, as a non-corrosive alternative to steel. 
So there are many different types of FRP. The most popular is glass, aramid, and carbon. From what you can see from this uh, 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 diagram is that even the glass, which is the weakest of the three, is at least two to three times stronger than, than steel. So um, the reason why fiberglass is the most popular among the different types of FRP is because it's cost effectiveness. It's already twice or three times stronger than steel. So there is no point of spending more uh, to get the carbon, for example. Uh, another thing we can extra extrapolate from this graph is basically the difference between FRP, regardless of what type of FRP and steel, is that FRP is linear up to failure, uh, while steel um, shows some ductility. Uh, SFTEX <clears throat> products uh, include, but not limited to, bars, shear connectors, as you can see here on the left, uh, bent bars, spirals, and, and uh, different shapes and types you can uh, uh, require in your job or, or project. Uh, two more uh, products were just recently introduced, which are the fiber, the carbon fiber sheets for restorations, and also the AR fiber for uh, concrete mixes. So why should we use um, uh, GFRP instead of steel? Uh, there are many advantages, of course, and uh, to start with, it's a longer service life. Uh, so you can expect two to four times uh, longer lifespan than steel. It has an improved durability in harsh marine environments. Um, it has, th the biggest thing is that it's uh, non-corrosive material. So it can uh, be used in, in different, uh, again, harsh environments, pipelines, and so on. Uh, it has a greater tensile strength than steel, as we showed before. Even glass has about three times uh, the strength of steel. However, it's about four times lighter than steel, um, which makes it very easy to work with it on the job site. Um, the non-corrosive uh, characteristics makes it suitable for harsh chemical environments, water purification stations, for example, uh, pipelines, and so on. It's also neutral to electrical and magnetic disturbances, which also can make them ideal for airports, uh, MRI rooms in hospitals, maybe military applications, and so on. So um, I will hand the mic to Dr. Ahmed. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, mic is yours. OK, thank you so much, Rick. I'm going to share my screen. Yep, let me stop sharing here. We can see your screen perfectly. Okay, thank you so much. So thank you so much, Rick, for this great introduction. Uh, before starting um, uh, talking about uh, our presentation today, I would like to thank my friend, Engineer Ali Od, for his help during the preparation of this presentation slides. Engineer Ali Od is a senior bridge engineer who served in many multinational consulting firms for bridges. Thanks again to him, and I'm wishing him the best in his career life and um, in his career path and life. So let us start by a question. What is a bridge? I have found two definitions for bridge. The first one is a definition from Merriam Webster Dictionary. Bridge is a structure carrying a busway or a roadway over a depression or obstacle. The second definition is according to H2 LRFD bridge design specification. H2 is the abbreviation of American Association of State Highway and the Transportation Official. According to H2, the bridge is defined as a structure with opening of 6.1 meter, and it is a part of a highway or solving an intersection from the highway, so it can be under or over the highway. 
What are the purposes of using bridges? The main purposes of using bridges are solving intersections, passing over railways, as we see here in this photo, to connect between two regions, as we see here in this photo, also to pass over oceans, seas, rivers, and the canals, as we see here in the last photo in this slide. The question now, what are the bridge components? This simple sketch represents the bridge components. As we see here, the bridge components are number one, deck. And the deck is a part that assigned for the highway. Number two, abutments and beers, which represent the bridge carrying system. Number three is the foundation, which represented the bridge support. The last part is the bearings, where it is responsible for carrying the loads from the deck to the beers and abutments. So the deck part is called as super structure while the lower part here, including the bearing, is called substructure. So the upper one is superstructure, the lower part is called substructure. As, a, as I talked in the previous slide, the bridge consists of two main parts, the superstructure and substructure. The superstructure, can be divided into two types, where the first type is called shallow or open sections. And this kind of sections is commonly used in small span bridges. As we see here in these sketches, from sketch number A to D, we have different shapes for shallow or open sections. Let us talk about them one by one. Shape number A is called solid slab bridge. And this shape can be used for RC bridges with its bands ranged from 10 to 12 meters. Shape number B is called voided slab bridge that can be used for RC bridges with its bands ranged from 15 to 20 meters. Finally, shapes C and D are called T girder bridges. T girder bridges consist of some beams, as you see here, we have some beams connected through a thin slab. So, shapes number C and D can be used for RC bridges with a band ranged from 20 to 25 meters. The second type is called cellular or closed section. In accordance with the need of long spans, the selection of the box girder is a good option where it provides a cross section with low dead load and a high inertia that could resist higher loads applied on bridges. As we see here in these drawings, we have different shapes for box girders. So the question, what is the criteria of selecting each shape? Generally, the selection of box, gird, uh, of box girder shape depends on many parameters, as the span length, bridge width, and the own, the own weight of the deck section. For substructures, We have different elements, as I presented before. The first element is abutment. The abutment is acting as the end vertical support for superstructure. Also, abutment retain the roadway backfill and resist lateral movement of Earth's backfill. 
we have two types of abutments open abutment or we can call it a spill through and the closed abutment if the height of the bridge is high so we can use the open abutment because it's hard to use the closed one accord because of the heavy weight and the huge cross section the second element of substructure is called beer which is directly connected with the super structure no i'm sorry so the second element of substructure is called beer and the beer represent the internal vertical support of the bridge we have two main types of beers the first one is called monolithic column the second type is called bearing beer or bearing frame the monolithic beer is directly connected with the super structure as we see here as we see here the column is directly connected with the super structure however here in this type the super structure is supported on bearings and the bearings transfer the loads from the super structure to the sub structure as we see here for the bearing beers or bearing frame types we have double cantilever frame we have column with beer head and the bearing beds we have a traditional frame the third element from the substructure is called bearings so the question what are the main rule of using this kind of bearings there are two main rules for bearings the first one transfer forces from bridge deck into beer and abutments number two minimum restraining of the deck due to thermal effect and the shrinkage of concrete we have three main types of bearings the first one is called cast iron bearing as we see here the cast iron bearing could be rocker bearing bin bearing or roller bearing and for the roller bearing we have single or multiple the second type of bearings is called elastomeric bearing and the third type of bearings is called boat bearing the boat bearing could be fixed free and guided in one direction now i would like to talk about field applications with frb bar and this part is the second part in our presentation first i would like to highlight on our national and international projects with sft gfrb bar the first application we have here is the first worldwide waffle slabs reinforced with gfrb straight and bent bars in araya project at northern coast another application for casting water breaks using our rebars as we see here on our right side another example here for casting the slab on grade in nova scotia canada finally we have another great field application with our sft gfrb shear connectors in precast sandwich panels at one of ibm building bridge projects across north america so let us talk about the bridge projects across canada and u.s in the last 20 years frb bars have been used in hundreds 
bridge structure across Canada. These bridges were designed according to the Canadian Highway Bridge Design Code and Ashton. FRB bars were used mainly as a reinforcement for thick slabs, barriers, and girders. Bridges are girder type with the main girders made of either steel or pre-stressed concrete. Main girders are simply supported over spans ranging from 20 to 90 meters. The deck thickness is ranging from 200 to 260 millimeters over a span of 2.3 to 4 meters. The bridge deck slabs may be cast in place or precast decks. Most of these bridges have been reinforced with glass fiber reinforced polymer bars as a result of their cost effectiveness. Building more durable bridges with extended service life of 75 to 150 years. More than 450 bridges were reconstructed here in Canada. These photos represent real field applications of bridge deck slabs reinforced with FRB bars across Canada in Ontario, Manitoba, Alberta, and the British Columbia. In the next slides, I will talk about some applications in detail. In these slides, we can see a field application for a bridge deck slab reinforced with FRB bars at Wotton Bridge. Wotton Bridge is located in the municipality of Wotton in Quebec. The bridge is a girder type with four main girders simply supported over a span of 31 meters with a 30 degree skew angle. The deck in this bridge is 200 millimeter thickness over three spans of 2.65 meter each and overhang of 1.15 meter on each side. A standard type IV ash to pre stressed concrete beams were used as main girders. Curbs, sidewalks, and the top layer of the deck slab for half of the bridge were reinforced with GFRB composite rebars. Within the same half of the bridge, a five meter wide portion of the bottom layer of the deck slab was reinforced with CFRB composite rebar. Another example for bridge decks reinforced with FRB bars in Magog Bridge. Magog Bridge is located over the Magog River on Highway 55 North Quebec near the US-Canada border. The total length of the bridge is 84 meters over three spans. The bridge is a girder type bridge with five main steel girders continuously supported on two middle beers, as we see here on the first photo on our left side. The thickness of the deck is 220 millimeters over four spans of 2.85 meters with an overhang of 1.35 meters on each side. One half span, including curbs, sidewalks, was reinforced with GFRB bars. The third example here we have is called Maurice Town Bridge. Maurice Town Bridge represent a good illustration for GFRB reinforced concrete bridge deck slabs. It is located in Maurice Town, Vermont at USA. The bridge has five main steel girders, integrally cast with two end abutments 
over a single span of 44 meters, as we see here on our right side. The deck is a continuous of 230 millimeter thick concrete slab, acting compositely with the five main steel girders. The concrete of the deck slab was totally reinforced with GFRB bars. This is the reason we call it a good illustration for a GFRB RC bridge deck. The deck slabs were designed according to ASHTO specifications and the ACI 440 guideline based on serviceability criteria of a maximum crack width of 0.5 millimeters. Here we have another FRBRC deck slab application at Cookshare Eton Bridge. This bridge is located in the municipality of Cookshare in Quebec. The bridge has five main pre-stressed concrete girders that were simply supported over two spans. The deck is a 200 millimeter thickness over four spans. One full span of the bridge was totally reinforced with GFRB bars as an internal reinforcement for the deck slabs. And the deck slabs in the second span was reinforced with conventional steel bars. The last field application of bridges we have today is called Nabigon River Cable State Bridge. This bridge is Canada first cable state bridge using GFRB bars. It consists of two spans and four lanes, as we see here on our right side. The Nibigon River Bridge is the only one of its kind in North America with three high precast towers. Each of the three towers is 50 meters high from the deck level and 75 meters high from the ground level. Now I will shift to the third section in my presentation that will be on analysis of GFRB, reinforced concrete bridge deck slab. In order to design the bridge deck, first we need to analyze the bridge using hand calculations or computer program. However, we need to calculate loads on bridge before conducting analysis step using any software or hand calculation. In the case of bridge deck slabs reinforced with GFRB bars, loads, load factors, as well as structure analysis should be done according to H2 LRFD bridge design specification. Also, the load combinations and load factors are specified in H2 LFRD bridge design specification. So the analysis of the bridge deck will be done according to H2 LRFD bridge design specification. While the design of the bridge deck will be done according to H2 LRFD bridge design specification. So the analysis will be done according to H2 LRFD bridge design specifications, and the design will be done according to H2 GFRB 2018 specification. Now I will talk about loads on bridges according to H2 LRFD bridge design specification. The first type of loads is called dead loads or DC. The dead load represents the own weight of decks, beers, abutments, and foundations. 
The second type of loads is called superimposed dead loads or DWs. This load represents the loads from wearing service on bridge, sidewalks, barriers, and handrails. This sketch represents part from superimposed dead load as the wearing service, as we see here, the wearing service, sidewalks, barriers, and handrails. The third type of loads is called traffic live load or LL. Traffic live load is divided into three main types of loads. Number one, truck load of weight 32 tons, as we see here on the sketch located on our right hand side. The weight of the truck is distributed on six wheels. So we have here, the weight from this truck is distributed on six wheels. The spacing between each two wheels in one X equals 1.8. The spacing between the first X and the second one is 4.3 meter, while the spacing between the second X and the third one ranges between 4.3 meters to 9 meters. Number two, tandem load of weight 22 tons. These 22 tons are distributed on four wheels, as we see here in this sketch. So every wheel will take a value of 510 kilo newton. The spacing between each two wheels in one X equals 1.8 meter, while the spacing between the two axes equals 1.2 meter. Load number three, as we see here in the top, is called lane load, which is a uniform load of 9.3 kilonewton per meter bare lane. So the question now, how can we apply these loads on the bridge? First, we should know the number of lanes. The number of lanes is the ratio between the roadway widths over the standard lane widths. The standard lane widths equals 3.65 meters. Then we are going to apply these loads per each lane. The load per each lane is a combination between truck and lane loads or tandem and lane loads. So we should select the case that will give us the maximum straining action on the bridge. Also, we have a special case of maximum negative bending moment in continuous bridges, which included two tracks with maximum spacing of 15 meters. During the moving of vehicles on the bridge, a dynamic effect could happen due to the non-smooth movement of the vehicles on the bridge. This effect is called impact load, or IM. This effect can be considered through increasing truck or tandem load by 33%, while this ratio is ignored for lane loads. As we see here on our right side, the table representing the used two cases and the impact load for each case. With the increase in the number of traffic lanes, it is not logical to use all these heavy loads in all lanes at the same time. So, the h 2 lrfd bridge design specifications recommends a factor called multiple presence factor in order to take the effect of repeating 
these heavy live loads on the roadway with the increase in the number of traffic lanes. As we see here in this table, for one lane, the multiple presence factor equals 1.2. However, for four lanes or more, the multiple presence factor equals 0.65. So what about the load on sidewalks? On sidewalks, we are using a pedestrian load of 3.6 kilonewton per meter square for sidewalks of 0.6 meter width. However, if the sidewalk width is less than 0.6 meter, we will not consider any loads on the sidewalk. The fourth type of load is called centrifugal force or CE. The movement of vehicle along a curved bridge will cause a force called centrifugal force. This force will be transferred from the vehicle to the bridge. The sketch here on our right side represents the pattern of centrifugal force on a curved bridge. Centrifugal force or CE can be calculated using this equation. In this equation, we have a new factor called C. So how can we calculate C? C can be calculated using this equation, where Z in this equation is the is speed, highway speed. F is a factor equals four over three. G is the gravity, is the gravity acceleration. R is the radius of the curvature. It should be noted that the centrifugal force shall be applied horizontally at 1.8 meter above the roadway surface. The fifth type of load is called braking force or BR. This force is resulted from the vehicle brakes. The braking force should be greater value from these two equations. The first one represents 25% of the design truck or design tandem, while the second equation represents 5% of the, of the design truck plus the lane load, or 5% from the design tandem and lane load. This photo on our right side shows that the braking force is a horizontal force. This load, I mean the braking force, is applied at a height of 1.8 meter from the roadway surface as the centrifugal force. The next load is called vehicular collision or CT. This load is resulted from the collision of vehicles with the carrying system like beers and abutments, as we see here in this sketch. So we see here like a vehicular collision between the vehicle and the carrying system. The vehicular collision or CT is considered in calculations due to the absence of sidewalks or islands separating the beer or abutment away from the roadway by a distance greater than nine meters. However, if this distance is less than nine meters, the value of CT will be ignored in calculation. Also, CT can be ignored in calculation in other two cases, 
Case number one, while having a barrier of height 1.37 meter behind the beer or the abutment at a distance less than three meters. Another case of having a barrier of height one meter and seven centi behind the beer or the abutment at a distance more than three meters. CT is applied at a height of 1.5 meter from the roadway surface with a value of 2,670 kN. The load number seven is called wind loads. Actually, in this slide, I'm going to represent another kind of loads. However, due to the limitation of time, I will talk about this load in detail through a solved example in another session. Number eight called earthquake loads. Number nine called earthquake pressure, live load surcharge, temperature effect, settlement load, breeze pressing loads, effect of creep and the shrinkage on concrete. Now I will shift to the fourth part in my presentation. That will be on design of GFRB reinforced concrete bridge deck slabs. As we agreed in the previous slides, the design of bridge decks will be done according to as to GFRB 2018. In the case of reinforcing our deck using GFRB bars, first I would like to highlight some limitation related to the design according to as to GFRB 2018. Number one, types of GFRB reinforcing bars. The use of sand coated, helical wrapping, and rabbit GFRB reinforcing bars is allowed due to their excellent bond with concrete. The use of reinforcing bar with a smooth external surface is restricted in this code. Why? Due to lack of bond development with concrete. The use of hollow type GFRB bars is also restricted. Why? Due to unknown performance as a reinforcement in concrete. Number two, the design and construction of lightweight concrete members internally reinforced with GFRB bars is not covered in H2 GFRB 2018 as specification. Because of the lack of research on this topic, the assumed failure mechanism of GFRB reinforced flexural members shall not be based on the formation of plastic hinges as GFRB bars demonstrate a linear elastic behavior up to failure. Moment redistribution in continuous members shall not be considered for GFRB reinforced concrete bridge members. The use of GFRB bars as a compression reinforcement of flexural members is not recommended by this code, but it is primitive to place this kind of bars in the compression zone of flexural members under one condition without considering them in the determination of the bar flexural resistance. The last limitation is on seismic design. Seismic design of GFRB RC members is not covered by the H2 GFRB 2018. Now I am going to list the mechanical properties requirement for GFRB bars as a reinforcing material in bridge structure. Number one, the tensile strength and strain for GFRB bars shall fulfill with the provisions of ASTM D7957. ASTM 
D7957 is the standard specification for solid round glass fiber reinforced polymer bars for concrete reinforcing. The guaranteed tensile strength of GFRB bars, or we can call it FF ultimate, is defined as the mean tensile strength calculated according to ASTM D7957 minus three times the standard deviation of the tested sample. Concrete bridge members reinforced with GFRB bars are typically subjected to exterior exposure because of long-term exposure to different environments may reduce the tensile strength, creep rupture, and the fatigue of GFRB reinforcing bars. The guaranteed tensile strength and the strain for GFRB bars should be reduced by considering environmental reduction factor in all design equations. So as I mentioned, the guaranteed tensile strength should be multiplied by CE and the guaranteed tensile strain should be multiplied by environmental reduction factor. So as we see here in this table, the environmental reduction factor CE equals 0.8 in case of concrete that not exposed to air or weather. Here, CE equals 0.7 for concrete exposed to air or weather. So we are reducing the guaranteed tensile strength and the guaranteed tensile strain to consider the environmental impact using the factor CE. The modulus of elasticity of GFRB reinforcing bars shall fulfill with ASTM D7957 as the average modulus of elasticity calculated from experimental tests for a frequency and the number of specimens. Let us talk about design philosophy according to H2 GFRB 2018. H2 GFRB 2018 specifications are based on limit state design principles, where structural components shall satisfy the requirements of service, fatigue, creep rupture, strength, and other extreme events. For the flexural design, the H2G FRB 2018 lists three possible modes of failure for a concrete section reinforced with GFRB bar. So we have balanced failure, which represented simultaneous rupture of FRB bars and concrete crushing, tension failure, which represents FRB bars rupture before concrete crushing, compression failure, which represents concrete crushing while FRB bars remain in the elastic range with a strain level smaller than the ultimate strain. The code mentions that tension and compression failure modes are acceptable in governing the design of flexural members under one condition. The strength and the serviceability requirements to be satisfied. However, in general, designing using compression control section satisfies serviceability criteria for deflection and the crack width. So, compression control section is the most desirable section for reinforcing bridge decks using GFRB bar. For compression control section, the factors flexural 
resistance MR shall be taken as we see here in this equation. So the factor of the flexural resistance MR equals phi by MN, where phi is the resistance factor. And it has three cases based on epsilon FT and epsilon FD. Epsilon FD is the design tensile strain of GFRB reinforcing bars, while epsilon FT is the tensile strain in extreme tension GFRB bar at nominal resistance. The nominal flexural resistance MN can be calculated using this equation. The depth of equivalent rectangular stress block A can be calculated using this equation. While the effective strength in the reinforcement FF can be calculated using this equation. Now I'm going to talk about creep rupture limit state according to H2 GFRB 2018. In this equation, we have two terms. We have right one and left one. The right one is called the allowable creep rupture limit, while the left one is the maximum tensile stress in the GFRB bar under service loads. So the creep rupture limit consists of two main factors. The first one is CC, which is called creep rupture reduction factor, CC equals 0.3 and FFD, the design tensile strength of GFRB reinforcing part. While the maximum tensile stress in the GFRB bar can be calculated using this equation. In this equation, we have NF, which is called the modular ratio. It is the ratio between the elastic modulus of the FRB bar to the elastic modulus of the concrete. D, is the distance from extreme compression fiber to centroid of tensile reinforcement. K, ratio of neutral axis depths to reinforcement depths. I crack is the cracking moment of inertia for transformed crack section. MSS, moment due to dead loads and sustained portion of live loads included in service I loads combination. Let us talk now about the creep rupture. In this equation, we have two terms. The term on our left side is called the maximum tensile stress in the GFRB bar under service loads and the fatigue loads, while the other side is for the allowable fatigue rupture limit. The maximum tensile stress in the GFRB bar should not exceed the fatigue limit, where the fatigue limit here equals the fatigue rupture reduction factor times the design tensile strength of GFRB bar. The fatigue rupture reduction factors, reduction factor, sorry, equals 0.25. The maximum tensile stress in the GFRB bar under service loads and fatigue loads can be calculated using this equation. In this equation, we have the same terms like the creep rupture limit but we have a new factor here called MSF. So MSF 
is the moment due to dead load included in service I load combination and factor the live load included in fatigue I load combination. The last point we have today is the cracking control in GFRB RC bridge deck slabs. The crack width is naturally subject to a wider scatter, even when measured in a careful laboratory work. The crack width is influenced by shrinkage and other time dependent effects. So steps should be taken in detailing of the reinforcement to control cracking. Improved crack control is obtained when the GFRB reinforcement is well distributed over the zone of maximum concrete tension. In other words, several bars at moderate spacing are more effective in controlling the crack than a smaller number of larger bar part of equivalent area. Consequently, by controlling the spacing between GFRB bars, we are controlling the crack. The H2 GFRB 2018 gave us an equation for maximum spacing between GFRB bars. The maximum spacing S should be less than or equal to the minimum of these two values. We have here this value and the other one. So we are going to calculate this one and the other one and select the minimum from these two values and compare it with the selected spacing. So the selected spacing should be less than or equal to the minimum of these two, a, of these two values. In this equation, we have some terms that should be defined. The first one is EF. EF is the tensile modulus of elasticity of GFRB reinforcement, FFS, calculated tensile strength in GFRB reinforcement at service limit state. TC is the clear concrete cover, and it should not be greater than two inch plus half the bar diameter. CB, reduction factor that accounts for the degree of bond between GFRB bars and concrete. S is the average spacing of reinforcement in a layer closest to tension phase. And finally, W is the maximum crack width of 0.7 millimeter. Thank you so much for continuing with me till the end. Thank you so much, Rick, for hosting this presentation.